And my name is Michael McLean and I'm the creator of the Michael McLean Talks YouTube channel. Before I go on, please remember to like, share, subscribe and comment on all of the content on this channel. And I please do remember to subscribe also because this will enable me to continue to bring you thought provoking, relevant, inspirational and um, just interviews that you just enjoy to watch. Thank you so much for coming onto the platform. You were listed on Screen Daily's list of the stars of the future in 2020. You also are the co-writer of Lovers Rock and Red, White and Blue in the BBC Small Act series. And you're also an acclaimed writer and author. So the first question I'd like to ask you is, please tell us about your early life and growing up in Shepherd's Bush. Um, yeah, I mean, that's such a huge question to start with. <laughs> Um, yeah, growing up in Shepherd's Bush was fun. I, I was born in West London and uh, I moved away when I was about I think a bit more than a year or so old, like a year, maybe two years old. I think something like that. We moved out, we moved further west to the suburbs. We moved to Slough and then after that, we moved even further west uh, to Uxbridge. And I lived in Uxbridge until I was about six or seven, I think. And Uxbridge, you know, Uxbridge in the, it's all about late 70s, man. You know what I mean? Like, you know, let's, it's Boris Johnson's constituency. I think it still is Boris Johnson's constituency. That will tell you everything, yeah? So, <laughs> so like, I'm growing up in the 70s, late 70s. There was a lot of good people there, man. My next door neighbours were so lovely to me. And, you know, I had a lot of good friends, but there was always this undercurrent of racism. And sometimes it was an overcurrent, you know, uh, my mom and my dad had to deal with a lot. But it's all mixed up, you know, because they were very, uh, you know, like they, they dealt with a lot of good things. And then they dealt with a lot of the rubbish stuff, you know, at the same time. It was never like really like black and white, like it was all bad or it was all good, you know. And so, um, yeah, yeah, I, you know, we, we were there for a while. And then my mum and dad split up and then my mum didn't really want to live far away. You know, we were the only black family for miles. There was one other family, maybe two other families in that area. My mum wasn't really feeling that on her own, bringing up two boys. She was worried for our mind state a little bit. You know, she wanted us to be familiar with our culture and people like us around us. So she moved us back uh, to Shepherd's Bush when I was about like, I must be six or seven or something like that. So obviously that was I was I was happy, but but it was a huge culture shock, and um, I just remember being like like very very made very welcome from the beginning, you know, like one of one of my oldest friends, if, you know, from those times. I met him in my first classroom back in Shepherd's Bush, and he reached out and he was just like, yeah, look, you're new, so let me take you under my wing, you know what I mean? Let me just show you what's what and this that and the other, and then. You know, just being back with my, my grandmother lived in Harlesden High Street. So being back close to my grandmother and my grandfather, who at that time, I think he lived in Shepherd's Bush. My uncle lived in, in Labrick Grove. I mean, just being back amongst my family and my friends, my cousins and all this stuff. It was just really cool. And straight away, I got into like my interests, you know, which was like music, which was books, which was the arts, you know, I really, I met like-minded individuals straight away who were also into that from a black perspective. And um, it was just fun, man. But, you know, it, it was, again, it was Shepherd's Bush in the 80s. So it was fun, but it was rough. You know what I mean? So there was that, again, it wasn't, wasn't all good and all bad. It was very complicated, you know. I don't know if that, so much to encompass. <laughs> you know I mean? And um, I was also reading in your bio that you started a drum and bass white label. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we put out a couple of white labels, you know, what I mean? like that one, maybe two, you know, to be to be honest, you know. But we had one that was really successful, and that just was us, you know, pulling all our money together, me and my friends, you know, like producing the record, to, you know, pull, pulling our money together to go to the studio, producing the record or at that time, the demo, and then, you know, saying, okay, we went around to a few record labels and we talked to them and, and no one was really biting. So we're like, all right, we're going to 
kite ourselves, man. You know what I mean? We could, there's a production thing down, um, where was it now? It was just off Barbie Road. Oh, or even further, I think. It wasn't Barbie Road. It was it was like just there's a very famous road by Sainsbury's in Labour Grove. Everyone knows it, and that's where Meanwhile Gardens, that road there. We went down there and we got it cut. Uh, or we got it made into a that tape, you know, and then we had to go and take it to, to no, actually, sorry, we went to to a dub plate specialist to cut acetates, you know what I mean, in Acton to get it cut onto a 10-inch plate, and then we got it from the 10-inch plate, got made into 12 inches, and we got it cut down by the Sainsbury's in Labour Grove. And, um, yeah, and then we went out. We, we printed a 1,000 copies of it, and we, we got in a van, and we drove around the country, man, selling them, you know, like giving them to record stores, coming back a couple of weeks later, picking up the money, picking up the returns. If there were returns, we just, we did all that. And at that time I was squatting, I was squatting in a, in a building in uh, Power Square, just at the back of Power Square. And that's what we did, man. And we just did it ourselves. So yeah, yeah, I did that. And, and, and I was very big in the rave scene at that time, you know, so that was, that was huge. You know, I think it was, uh, you know, talking about 88, 89, I think, you know, I mean, something like that, maybe uh, maybe 90. I can't remember what year it was, but we were up and down, you know, like, like going to the warehouse raise, the raising fields, you know, I mean, the club raise. And it was just a bit at the beginning of the, um, the hardcore scene, which then slowly turned into the drum and bass scene and then became the jungle scene. So, like, I was really lucky to be there when all that was going off, which was amazing. That's really, really cool. You, you had a very vibrant um, early life, and that's really cool. Yeah, wondering, <laughs> Yeah, following on from that, what were the factors that influenced your decision to become a writer? Well, I mean, there was no real decision, you know, like I was always a writer. I mean, from like about three years old, I was telling people stories, like adults around me. I would just be like tugging on their on their trousers and store their skirts and being like, oh, I've got a story to tell you. And, uh, and my mom says I taught myself to read like when I was about three years old or, or, you know, at that time I was reading just like I just did. You know, there's a picture of me in my cot lying there at three years old, two years old, something like that. Just just with a little picture book. And I'm like this, you know, <laughs> reading this book and it just came naturally to me. So there was no decision. It was just what I did. It was what I was interested in. And uh, that, of course, went on to a few years later, me wanting to tell my own stories. So I started writing very young. I started writing like eight, nine. And, and you know, by the time I was 10, 11, I was trying to write novels, you know, I was trying to write, or trying to write a novel, you know. And so as soon as I could, I got skilled enough to be able to put my thoughts down with a pen. I did that. And then by the time I was eight or nine, I started rapping, you know, seven or eight. I was really into hip hop. So, uh, you know, I listened to it on the pirate radio stations, LWR, Horizon, you know, uh, you know, uh, Kiss a little bit later when it was a pirate. So I listened to those and I used to sit in my room, just, you know, twiddling with the knob, trying to find them, trying to find hip hop. And then I, and I was like, oh, I want to emulate that. But even before that, I was like into like my dad used to take me to dances, blues dances and whatever. And uh, I'd try and get on the mic, man. And I'd try and be toasting them times. Before even I started hip hop, I toasted first. You know what I mean? <laughs> and then afterwards I heard hip hop and I was like, oh yeah, I want to do that. So I was writing, yeah, from very, very young. And then when I got into my teenage years, I got really into hip hop. I met my, one of my oldest friends again. He was an MC. He was friends with my best friend at school. They'd gone to primary school together. They lived on the same estate, White City. And they knew each other. And so we all became friends. And then we would go to his DJ's house, Scratch Professor in Harrow Road. And we'd just like ciphers, you know what I mean? We'd be in the basement, just like lyrics, writing lyrics, coming back the next day with new lyrics, just battling each other and stuff and just like having fun. And, and, and that, while I was doing that, I was writing stories, you know, at the same time. I was reading books, loads of books by then, and I'd be like emceeing, but also writing prose. And I wrote a lot of short stories in that time, right up until I was about 19 or so. And then I was like, all right, I'm going to have another go at writing a novel. That's really, really, that's really um, powerful. And 
You've written a number of successful plays, including Estates of Mind and Woman of Troy. What are some of the greatest challenges you experienced throughout your journey as a writer? Uh, I suppose the main challenge was just uh, trying to express myself as I am. And I think that's a challenge for all artists, but in particularly black artists, uh, very much in particularly, uh, in particular, I should say, um, black British artists, you know. Uh, so there's always that, that, that balance between art and commerce. You know, there's always, always that balance in that. And I think um, I've struggled with that because obviously the way that we're interpreted outside of us and the way that we interpret ourselves is two completely different things. And I've always been more interested in the way that we interpret ourselves, you know? So that can cause problems sometimes. And, we, you know, if you manage, if the way you interpret yourself and the way that they interpret you align, then you're good. You know what I mean? It's all right. But then sometimes uh, that doesn't happen. You might have a particular vision which is outside of that. And then people struggle with that. I think with my playwriting, I found that a lot because my playwriting was a little bit more left field compared to what I was doing writing wise at the time the image that i was presenting writing wise at the time was very acceptable to people i was writing about the rough side of london the rough side of west london the rough black side of west london and that was palatable to people that was palatable that was saleable that was marketable uh, my playwriting i wasn't really doing that you know i was doing women of troy <laughs> i mean like right now it's kind of doing greek science fiction fantasies and stuff and that was really like what the hell is he playing at what is he doing and uh, they were successful. They were really successful. But, um, you yeah, know, it couldn't really plug into what the mainstream thought black art should be doing, black playwriting should be doing. And so the biggest challenge for me has just been to, uh, you know, uh, express myself uh, without any hindrance. I mean, that's what most artists look for, right? That, that, that real freedom of self-expression. And... Um, yeah, that's about it, really. I mean, everything, everything else comes... You know, I don't really struggle with writing. I don't really struggle with, like, living the life. I love I loved doing that. But but yeah, I've, had, I've always had to, I think, bump up against um, trying to, to express myself in a way that aligns, basically. Lord, may you protect your servant, Leroy. Please keep him safe for his police training. Attention! And grant us the wisdom to accept his decision. At least this way, Dad, I can change things. Get out of my house! Out there, it is us and them. That's how it works. Stop, please! Sometimes I think the earth needs to be scorched. We planted so something good will come of it. Oh, that was um yeah, that was really, really cool just to learn about your whole writing experience and one thing that's quite incredible about you is at the age of 23, you published your first novel, um, the, the Scholar of West Side Story. So what advice would you give to uh, aspiring young authors that want to follow in your footsteps? Um, I don't know, because like everything, everyone's different, right? <laughs> I mean, it's like, uh, I, don't, I wouldn't necessarily feel like, like my, my particular path is um the way that other people should go and also that thing about age i mean thinking about that a lot you know that thing, and number one thing i remember talking with a couple of other writers who were published uh quite young and we were all a little bit like mm, it's good and bad you know? <laughs> you know what i mean it's like 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 there's 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 uh cons as well as the pros of that mainly the cons are to do with the fact that you're so young and and you know you're not fully formed as a writer yet yeah. and who's ever fully formed you're never fully formed but you know like you're still at the beginning you know of your process and so that comes with all kinds of like issues which you then have to tackle so i very much feel like i was like growing up in public artistically 
And then there's other writers, you know, I don't know how special that is. There's other writers who were published before me. The guy just won the booker. He was published like much younger than I was. So, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, I don't, I try not to, to be like, oh, I got published when I was 23 and that mean, makes me some special in any kind of way because I don't think it does. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just, if I had to give advice to anyone, I'd just be just, just write, man. Just really like write live it get into it and when i say live it like you know also read also get into all other art forms live as someone who's really interested in the thing that you're doing and and enjoy it and have fun with it and don't think too much about oh i need validation from a publisher or or you know a contract or money or fame or all those other things that people tend to attach to it and i know that's easy easy to say once you've been published <laughs> i mean i wanted those same things as well when i started out. i wanted a deal now you know what i mean but uh i think i think enjoying the process as they call it is 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 really it reaps a lot of rewards and like my old mentor who just passed away used to say to me he said yeah it's going to be easy to get published yeah you're going to get that but you've got to have a goal that's bigger than being published. You've got to have something. What comes after? Because if you achieve that and you achieve that early and you've got nothing else, you're going to be done. And, uh, yeah, I took that to heart. Yeah. Thank you for such great advice for aspiring young journalists. Following on from what you said about validation, you've been rejected so many times throughout your career. I read your interview with The Guardian. Mm-hmm. So how did you overcome rejection to become the successful novelist and writer you are today? Just get on with it, you know? You just like, you know, there's no other way to say it. Just get on with it, man. I'm still rejected. I'm just, you know, just because I did, like, you know, uh, Small Nets with Steve and stuff, it doesn't mean that I'm still not getting rejected. It's, it's a part of our part of our business, man. It's like being an actor or, or something, you know? Like, you've got to go out there and you've got some people are going to say no. You can get rejected in different ways as well. You can get a book out, book. You can get a book out and still get rejected. You can get rejected by you know the, the reviewers, you know what I mean, or the press, or you might not go the way exactly the way you want it. You have to kind of um, not care. And I remember talking about this with another writer, and they were talking about you know how it, it hurt them to be rejected by big major publications and stuff. And I was like, I don't care. Like, I honestly don't care. I mean, not to say that I don't feel hurt when someone doesn't like my stuff. That's, yeah, it can, it can hit me. But I try not to let that bother me so much because uh, ultimately I don't want anything to impinge on what it is I'm trying to do. And if I care too much about whether you like it or anyone else likes it, and I mean by the praise as well you know what I mean like if people say oh yeah that was hot that was that really good and you did this and you were published when you were 23 and I get all up in that and think about that too much that might distract me from what I'm trying to do so I try not to worry whether people like it a lot or or dislike it a lot and rejection is part of that if I believe in something you know I believe in the scholar it got rejected massively in the beginning um you know I see free got published in the year 2000 that was like you know people didn't like it at the time it's just had its 20 year anniversary it's just come out again and people are like oh now we understand 20 years later what you were doing when you did IC3 I always knew and I never doubted that book and I have a criteria for myself which is when sometimes I'll be like mm, maybe that could have gone better but even that is that that part of my writer's journey to get me onto the next thing and where I will do better so, so I just don't think about it too much. You know, I, I won't go. Some people are like, oh, I don't. I really, really, really don't care in the sense that, and I might sound like that sometimes, bullshit. Like I don't give a damn, and it doesn't affect me. That's not the same thing. It does affect me, but then I've got to carry on and be like, okay, well, that's what that that happened. I got rejected recently by like every publishing house in the US. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and, I, and all my short stories for Cosmogram have got rejected, every single one of them. But then now Cosmogram is out, and everyone's like, "Oh, these stories are brilliant." Go figure. You know what I mean? It's like that's why you can't let it affect you either way, whether they say it's good or bad. Just, yeah, just do what you do. The the thing that um, is so special about your answer is Emma Heskey said a similar thing to you when I interviewed him. Really? 
about rejection, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's all just like subjective, right? And it's all what other people think. And you, as, if you're going to put yourself out there publicly, I mean, I imagine like Emil, man, he misses a goal or something, you know? <laughs> like, like, you know, like what people are going to be saying in the stands and stuff, you know what I mean? You have to be able to block that out, man. Otherwise, you won't be able to move forward. You can't be taking on these thousands of opinions that are out there. I can't. I can't. So, sometimes, you know, uh, you know, I look at things online or what people are saying about the books or what people are saying about small acts or what people are saying that, you know, and I just be like, yeah, okay, that's fine. That's your opinion and your title to it. I'll even listen to it sometimes. People have told me straight things that I don't want to hear about my stuff. I'm like, fine, I, I'll have that, have that conversation with you. But at the end of the day, I know why I did it and this is why, and that's not going to change anything. So I'll, I'll disagree, you know, with, with respect, you know. Thank you so much. I've been watching you for so long. It's a shame. BBC Small Acts episodes, Red, White and Blue and Lovers Rock, the latter, was listed on the British Film Institute Sight and Sound as the best film of 2020. So please tell us a bit about how the opportunity to write for BBC Small Acts came about. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I, can't, I can't take on the Sight and Sound thing. It's really great and I appreciate the, the love and everything, but... Uh, yeah, I, I always try and forget that and not think about it too much. But um, yeah, I met I met uh, I met Helen Bart years ago uh, when I did a play called Look to the Sky, uh, Half Moon Theatre in Limehouse, and it was a play for young people. I did this crazy, weird, abstract play <laughs> uh, for them, which was very, very surreal. And Helen came to interview me about that, and then I was like, okay, we got on. We had a really nice chat. I thought that was it. I'll never see Helen again, but it was really nice meeting you. And uh, she went off into the sunset. <laughs> no, I'm joking. But, but then, uh, yeah, and then, and then, yeah, I got a phone call from her. I was in Sheffield doing a, a playwriting project and uh, I got a phone call from her and she was like, would you be interested in uh, the Steve McQueen project? I'm kind of, I've told that story really weirdly wrong. What actually really happened was I was sitting in the room where we were doing a playwriting project and someone came up to me and gave me a piece of paper. And when I opened it, it had a Helen Bart's phone number on and it said, uh, Steve McQueen's office has called about the Steve McQueen project. Can you call this number? And then I went outside at lunch break and I called the number and it was Helen Bart. And she said, do you remember me from you know, the interview that I did. And I said, yes. And she said, would you like to come in and talk to us about doing this project? And I was like, hell yes. Uh, because I'd been watching the project for about three years or so. Uh, go on, you know, and I'm, I'm from West London, as you know, and it was about West London. It's about Black British people. I was like, this is me. This is my project. I, I really should be on this. But I was prepared to let it go because I didn't have any screenwriting credits. I knew that there's you know, Steam Queen, Oscar winners doing it. So he doesn't know who I am. So it's not going to happen. And then I got that phone call. So, uh, yeah, I went and met the producers. I met the head of development, gave them my scripts, and they liked my scripts. So then it was like, okay, so we, you know, you're going to have to meet Steve, though. It's like, we think you're cool. We think you're great. Yeah, we get on with you. This is all great. Your scripts are brilliant. That's cool. But now now you have to meet Steve because he makes the final decision. And I was like, oh, God. I thought this was done. I thought I could just do it here. You give me the job. You know? But they're like, no, you have to meet Steve. And so we did. We did maybe about just under a year or so later, actually. It took a while to get that together. We met him and, yeah, yeah, we clicked. Yeah. I didn't think so at the time. I was like, I really messed that up, but but, but we we got on all right, yeah. Thank you so much for that, and yeah, I really enjoyed both of those um, films very much. So yeah, it was brilliantly written. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And following on from that, I'd like to ask, what do you like most about being a writer? Um. I like most about being a writer, you know, obviously the chance to use my imagination, to use my brain, 
for a long time when I was working, I used to just be, do physical work. I was like lugging stuff around. I was a door to door salesman for a while and I was just not using my brain and I didn't really, that didn't feel good. Uh, it's really hard work. It's like the hardest work I've ever done. Uh, this writing stuff. And I just recently, um, I uh, did a PhD and you know, I, I passed. So, um, yeah, that, that was that was the hardest thing, even harder than writing books. And screen. that's the hardest thing I've ever done brain wise. But it also felt really good, you know, and it felt like, OK, I'm, a, I'm, I'm achieving what I really think I'm capable of, you know. So um, that's one of the best things. But also just being my own person as well, man, you know, getting to, you know, uh, work when I want to work, you know, uh, you know, uh, be at home for my kids. You know, like I take them to school, I can be at home when they come home, or I can go and pick them up, you know, uh, just being around for them. It's really cool. Just that that uh, autonomy uh, of self is really brilliant too. Thank you so much for that. And you recently published a, a critically acclaimed novel called A River Full Time. Please tell us a bit about the book and the message you're aiming to convey to the reader. Hmm. Um, the book is uh, set in a parallel world uh, or a parallel timeline where slavery and colonization never happened so because that never happened African cosmology is the dominant religion so like ancestor worship chakras uh, you know belief in karma you know, all of these you know, spiritual attributes that we have traditionally, not just African people, but people, indigenous cultures all over the world, uh, those things are absolutely normal. You know, like there's no, you know, and, and secularism actually is abnormal. You know what I mean? Like, there's no, I mean and, and that's manifested in particular ways. But everyone believes basically in, in the spiritual realms. Everyone believes that you can, there are other, um, uh, there are other spiritual planes that, that your body you can leave behind your body you can access them uh because of the leap in technology that most people access them mechanically now very few people access them physically but but there is that belief that it's there and uh yeah the novel follows a character marcus denny who begins the finds that he can uh spontaneously project into these different planes and therefore access different other parallel worlds yeah, to, to to the world that he begins in. So that's what it's about. Um, I don't know, like, what was I trying to say? I mean, I suppose there are a few things you try and say because, like, thematically, you've got things that you want to talk about. But I didn't come to the book saying I want to say stuff. I came to the book like, this is a really cool idea and I don't think anyone's done this before. <laughs> that was my driving force. It wasn't that I had to say something. I saw a review that said, oh, you know, it seems like I wanted to make a big statement. And that's so far from the truth. I didn't actually want to make a big statement. I just wanted to tell a really cool story. But in that story, you, you know, you've got to have themes and intention, you know what I mean? And then, yeah, things that you want to say come out of that. But they're varied, you know, and they're complicated. And actually, I don't want anyone watching this to be dictated by me as to what the book is actually about i actually i'm going to resist that because I, I feel like i want everyone to have their own impression of the book i have a friend in jamaica she read my book and she said to me look i've read your book i just wanted you to know that i really really like it this was the gospel according to Cain. she said i really really like it but her name's kelly uh kelly magnus she said i'm not going to talk to you about this book because i have my interpretation of the book in my head and i want to keep it and if i talk to you it's going to make me not think about my interpretation i'm going to think about yours and i was like that's really cool i like that you know what I mean? so i think with that book you know make of it what you will i'm not gonna i'm not gonna put that on people um people should be able to find what they think it is about it's definitely about some stuff people might think oh it's really complicated and it's hard to, to work out what it's about but i think if they if they think instinctively they'll get it i really believe that it's actually really interesting that you talked about the whole you know ancestors and the whole spiritual side of things that's similar to star wars everyone has a different interpretation of what the force means 
Yeah, yeah. And George Lucas doesn't sit down and tell people what, what he meant. You know what I mean? He doesn't ever talk about it. And I like the fact, you know, it's funny you should bring up George Lucas because, you know, obviously growing up, he was a major inspiration. And um, what I love about him is that he doesn't explain stuff to people. You know what I mean? Like, he never explained <laughs> the force to people. And then when he tried to, it went wrong. <laughs> you know, people were like, oh, we don't like that interpretation. I actually like that interpretation that he had. You know, that people say, oh, he should have left out midichlorians. I think it's a cool idea. But as soon as he started trying to do that, people were like, oh, it doesn't marry with what's in my head and whatever. So, but he's really good at leaving uh, gaps. You know, there are so many things about the world of, 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 of Star Wars that just we don't know the answers to. And I'm totally cool with that. That's all right. Thank you. And the next question I'd like to ask you is, you are a, a very successful writer. How do you believe your success will um, pave the way for the next generation of Black British writers? Okay, right. Well, success is kind of like subjective too, right? Like successful in who some people might be like, oh, you're successful. And other people like will be like, that's not successful. You know, someone else is more successful. Someone else has done this and the other. So, so uh, I mean, for myself, I feel pretty good. You know, I feel like I'm in a good place. Uh, I don't know, yeah, if it's success, but but I'm happy. You know, that's the main thing. Um, I know, and like paving the way. I don't know, man. I just, I don't think that's an individual thing for for especially for Black British writing. I don't think paving the way for people can come from me singularly. You know what I mean? I just don't. No, that's not going to happen. Uh, it has to be me and everybody else who's doing this thing. And that means every single person is going to help make movement for the people that are coming afterwards. So, so uh, I'm just going to, I mean, I'm just going to try and be myself. That's all I can do. And if that inspires someone, that's really cool. That's brilliant. I love that. And, and, and if someone else inspires someone, that's cool too. And again, it's another thing that I just can't think about. I can't really be thinking about that. What's my legacy? Or like that. I can't really, because uh, I'm, I'm really concerned with just uh, what is it I'm doing? What am I trying to create here? What's the next thing? Do I like it? How do I feel about it? Um, and that's, again, subjective too. So sorry, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm sorry if I'm not answering the questions in the way that you want, you'd like me to, but that's my only answer. I, I can't, I can't really think about paving the way even with my son you know like i'm like i can't i don't want to influence him too much in the sense of like trying to dictate to him what he should do you know what i mean like he needs to find his own path and do his own thing and where, wherever that leads I'll, I'll try and support him man as much as possible as long as it's positive and it's good for himself then i'll try and help that but i don't want to think about whether i'm setting a good example or whether you know what i mean all of those things you know like mm-hmm. yeah yeah, no, I say it was it was a it was a brilliant answer. I was yeah. really in, cool. inspired by it actually. Yeah. yeah, cool. So, please tell us about some of the projects and books you're working on in 2022. Um, so I'm going to be working on a few screenplays. Um, I, I kind of can talk about them. I'm not, I'm not sure how much I should talk about them, so I'm not going to say anything. But like, I'm working on a couple of the screenplays. And I've got a couple of projects, TV projects that I'm trying to develop. Um, I'm at the very beginnings of developing. There are a few things I've already got to like, you know, pitch document and pilot stage. I'm hoping those will get made. Um, I'm not doing any theatre for the foreseeable. Uh, not to say I'm not into it. I just, I'm not, I haven't got any offers. I haven't got anything going on at the minute, but I hope to at some stage. Um, and books wise, I'm going to take a bit of a break. Uh, Because I've got, I've had two books out this year. I think that's enough. (laughs) I mean, I could, I could have another one out next year if, if, if things went well. I mean, I've got, there's a book there, but, but I think I should wait a little bit and just see what happens. And it's not finished, so um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna work on that very, very slowly, and I'm gonna try and work on another novel very, very slowly. But at the minute, I'm, I'm just trying to spend some time like making the things I've already got already, the films, I've got the, the two features, making them right. I was working on one today. Another one's like got sent off a couple of weeks ago. So I'm going to be into the drafting process of those. 
So just yeah, mainly mainly film right now. So when you film, do you mean like in Hollywood film or like TV films? And then um, I mean, I mean, yeah, yeah, I can say that. I mean, feature films. So not for TV, for the cinema films. Uh, both of those are, are film films. Um, I don't even know what that means, but, <laughs> but they're, films, they're films that you'll be able to go to the cinema and watch. I mean, it's all and that, all of that is in flux right now, right? Because you know the people are asking, "What is a film? Is small acts a film or TV?" I mean, like, a I don't care. You know what I mean? Like, I watched films on TV since I was a little kid. I saw Close Encounters of the Third Time, Third Kind. Sorry, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I saw that when I was about like eight or nine years old at Christmas. You know what I mean? On my little like, it must have been a fifteen-inch TV, and it felt like a widescreen screen one in the IMAX to me when I saw that movie you know what I mean like it didn't diminish it whatsoever so this idea that you that, that films can't be on TV is just complete crazy I saw most of my films as a kid on TV you know what I mean? like so and that's what got me into film so I don't understand the question I don't get it um so so yeah they're, they're films and you'll be able to see them on TV eventually at some stage Netflix or whatever maybe I don't know Amazon, whatever, but you will be able to see them on TV. But but they are they're, they're feature length, you know, ninety minutes plus movies. Yeah, yeah. And and then you know, and then, and it's not a long running TV series, which is the other stuff I'll be working on. Is like seasons, you know, five seasons for each of the shows that I'm working on, which is a lot more like a novel. Wow. Well, thank you so much for such a brilliant interview. I've thoroughly enjoyed interviewing you. Oh, cheers, man. I really like the questions and stuff. And yeah, it's good talking to you.